Uh, and our final uh, <laughs> witness, uh, uh, a frequent and well-respected uh, visitor to uh, these uh, confines, uh, Mr. Gene Kimmelman, is uh, Legislative Director of the Consumer Federation of America. We welcome you back once again. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the Consumer Federation of America, I appreciate the opportunity to express our views on uh, cable television matters. Um, we're certainly not here today to beat up on the cable industry. Um, I agree with what many of you have said and what the cable representatives have said. They have done a lot of good for American consumers. I um, also agree with Mr. Ronaldo and uh, the sentiments of many of you that uh, we do not support regulation where it is unnecessary. We do not think regulation is a panacea. Uh, but we want to bring to your attention, from a consumer perspective, a number of uh, abuses that we believe the cable industry has engaged in in the marketplace that uh, we think you should address to serve the American public. Um, we believe that since passage of the Cable Communications Act of 1984, uh, many of the largest cable companies have abused their power by expanding their control over subscribership base in this country through horizontal concentration, enhancing their market power and leveraging against programmers in an anti-competitive fashion. Similarly, these large companies have expanded vertically into the programming business, buying up the key, most popular programming that the American people want to see, and again, leveraging in an anti-competitive fashion against programmers, against potential competitors. And we believe as a result of this behavior, uh, one of your main goals of enhancing competition in the communi Cable Communications Act has not been achieved. And as a result, we find the American public overcharged and underserved in its uh, cable television uh, today. So CFA believes it's time to make some corrections in the Cable Act along the lines suggested by Congressman Cooper and his legislation to bring cable rates down in line with today's market conditions and to improve service to expand the potential for competition in the future uh, for American consumers. And the key problem to focus on here for the consumer is the fact that cable television offers a package of service, a package defined by the cable operator. They decide what it is. It's a package of programming that is not available in general in any other form in the American marketplace. You receive the over-the-air networks on cable. You receive all-day news. You can see the Congress, entertainment, sports, access to movies, a broad package of programming defined by the cable provider <coughs> that is not available anywhere else a package of programming the American people want and feel they need. Survey after survey shows that television, particularly this broad package of programming, provides the main source of news and entertainment for the American people. So people will pay whatever they have to for this cable service. They need it, even if the service is lousy, because their only alternative is to give it up. Now, unfortunately, the Federal Communications Commission has interpreted competition to cable to be three over-the-air signals. Those three signals, plus this entire package, is what cable offers. Clearly, there is no competition from three over-the-air signals for this package of programming that only the cable television industry offers to the American public. So, as a result of this lack of competition, cable companies have been able to increase their rates without governmental oversight, allowing them to earn excessive profits. Now, market data demonstrate that cable rate increases are generating so much revenue beyond costs, beyond reasonable profits for the cable operator, that a full infusion of competition, or since it's not available, it's surrogate regulation, should drive rates down 50 percent, saving consumers $6 billion a year while leaving the cable industry to earn a reasonable profit like anyone else in the marketplace. Before deregulation, basic rates never went up as much as inflation. Mr. Mooney bemoaned that. There was a good reason for that. They only went up on average two-thirds the rate of inflation for a very good reason. The costs to the cable industry have been declining. As more and more subscribers come on the network, the cost per subscriber of service goes down. It's a declining cost industry. But since deregulation, even using the most conservative estimates, rates are up at least two to three times the rate of inflation compared to less than inflation before deregulation. Now, to deal with this problem, we believe Congress must act 
because the marketplace will not address it with a concentration of power that cable has developed in the past few years. The horizontal base of cable in its largest entities is massive. TCI and ATC, the two largest cable uh, companies, control almost 40 percent of subscribers. If someone wants to sell programming to cable, you have to get on the <coughs> TCI and ATC networks or you don't sell your programming. As a result, they leverage, and according to these programmers, they leverage anti-competitively to control the marketplace. Similarly, these companies have tried to enhance their market power by buying into programming. ATC, the large, second largest cable operator, is owned by Time Inc., has recently merged, merged with Warner. They own HBO. By controlling this key programming and controlling a large subscribership base, they dictate the terms under which programming can be sold to other technologies that could compete with cable. And according to these technologies, these other alternative providers, they have been thwarted in the marketplace. Now, to correct these market distortions, we believe legis legislation is needed to redefine effective competition, ensure that regulation protects consumers wherever they cannot have an alternative to this package of service that cable offers, to prevent cable from denying access to alternative technologies, legislation is needed, and to preserve diversity, we must have diver diverse sources from cable programmers. We therefore urge you to correct the Cable Act, make these minor changes, and ensure that the potential for competition that you envisioned in 1984 will ultimately be, be met in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kilman. And we thank all of the witnesses for their opening statements. And now we'll turn to questions from the uh, subcommittee members for our panel. And uh, the chair will recognize itself, uh, himself for a, an opening round. Uh, let me begin by asking you, Mr. Mooney. I, I said in my opening statement that uh, uh, in order to deal with the problems which have arisen in the uh, field of uh, the cable industry, that uh, some legislation uh, is necessary. Um, do you agree with that statement? Predictably not. <laughs> uh, although we are realists, and I am a realist, and if uh, the relevant committees of Congress dis disagree with us and, and proceed with legislation, then we will uh, want to be uh, a constructive participant if we are allowed to uh, in the process. <coughs> okay. Well, our goal, as you can imagine, is to be deliberate, uh, thoughtful, uh, but at the same time uh, uh, moving forward in a in a uh, uh, in a way that does ensure that there are safeguards put in place where necessary, in order to ensure that where uh, there is no competition uh, present to accomplish the goals which the a free market would otherwise produce for consumers, uh, that there be some substitute system which does give those guarantees. Uh, let me let me ask you, Mr. Mooney, and the others on the panel, uh, because it has become. Uh, a subject over the last several months of, of conversation um, uh, between the, those of you on the outside and uh, members of the subcommittee, uh, including uh, the chair. Uh, and that is the subject of a lifeline service uh, that could be adopted as a way of uh, protecting the lower income uh, portion of the population in the country. And uh, as the concept is uh, presented in its uh, basic form, uh, the Congress or the FCC would mandate the establishment of a lifeline tier uh, consisting of broadcast channels, public access channels, and possibly uh, C-SPAN, CNN, or similar informational channels. Uh, that lifeline tier would be subject to local regulation, but would be priced well below existing basic tiers, probably for a fee ranging from 5 to $10 a month. Um, now, such a tier, it seems to me, would be the best method to help the low-income subscribers and those uh, households who merely want an antenna service. Um, but I question whether the adoption of a lifeline service offers anything to working-class, middle-class families that have sufficient income. 
uh, to be able to pay for the service, given the problems that they have with uh, cable. Um, so I'll ask each of you very briefly, if you could, maybe we can go to you first, Mr. Mooney, uh, whether or not you would uh, favor the adoption or could you support uh, or accept the adoption of some kind of lifeline uh, system being uh, put in place? And uh, if you could, uh, what would you then uh, uh, propose that we do with those questions that uh, would be uh, still raised by those in the middle income uh, brackets of the country with regard to their problems with the cable industry? Well, the reason I made the comment that I did a few minutes ago with respect to uh, the situation in Laredo is because I believe that the elimination uh, in a number of cable systems of the what now has been described as, as the lifeline tier, but, it w uh, but which at one time was called basic service, and the consolidation of those tiers into larger tiers uh, is, in, in my view, what has caused a lot of the political problem around the country, and I drew your attention to that uh, because I think you ought to know that. Uh, I think that our position uh, with respect to effectively the mandatory uh, recreation of tiers of that sort would, would depend on, on a number of things. I mean, first, we would have uh, great cause for concern at any requirement that a service like CNN uh, be included in such a tier. Uh, CNN is undoubtedly an attractive, valuable uh, service. It is one of the crown jewels uh, of cable programming. But it is not as if news were uniquely available from CNN. You've got, you got plenty of other news outlets in this country. You've got ABC, NBC, CBS, local TV stations, radio stations, all news stations, uh, and, and, and so forth. And I think that you would really uh, try uh, and, and, and so forth. And I think that you would really uh, try the ability of, of even Ted Turner uh, to continue to provide a, a, a good service if you put it back un, under regulation. Second, we would have great difficulty with any form of, of, with any form of re-regulation which involves simply putting this back in the hands of the city councils. Uh, regulation is a word which we customarily use to describe a situation in which you've got a quasi-judicial body operating on the basis of a coherent intellectual theory and doing so in a temperamentally dispassionate manner. None of those qualities, I think, can be ascribed to city councils. So I guess, Mr. Chairman, the answer to your question uh, would be that we are not theologically, uh, we don't theologically recoil from the suggestion of the periodic re re readjustments, but, but a lot of it would depend so on what just it is. In summary, then, you would uh, support then or could accept uh, the broadcast channels, C-SPAN, uh, and the uh, public access channels being part of that, but beyond uh, those uh, limited services, you would not envision uh, I, I think it any would other be, inclusion in a lifeline service? I think it would be manifestly imprudent of me to sit here and try to negotiate pieces of, of, of a bill, but I, I think the chair knows that, that we customarily try to be reasonable people. That is the, the history uh, of the negotiations um, thus far. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> me, Mr. Kemmelman, could you please uh, very briefly give, me, give your view so that I can, uh, my time is uh, almost expired and I would like Mr. to keep Mr. Chairman, I think that's a partial response. We believe clearly there's no competition for some of those services, local access and, and C-SPAN. But we think the entire uh, uh, tier of services that are now called basic ought to be subjected to appropriate scrutiny. Mr. Mooney claims that there is competition for CNN. There are other forms of, of news uh, programming and other sources of, of news. That's perfectly fine. Let's just have a coherent test. Uh, and if he is, is averse to at the local level, uh, at the federal level is fine with us at the FCC to test whether there really is competition for the kinds of programming cable offers. If there is competition, fine, don't regulate it. But if there isn't, we think we should have limits on prices. Great. Uh, my time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Rinaldo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, begin uh, with Mayor Ramirez. Uh, was your complaint specifically just with service, 
or is it with service and rates, or is it just with rates? I think it's a combination of both, Congressman, and I'd like to just touch on what Mr. Mooney mentioned in his statements. Well, uh, but perhaps can you do that yes, later? Yes, for us. Yes, sir. Yeah, in other words, I, I what I'm telling you very bluntly is do it on somebody else's time. Not I'm yours. Five All right. Minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> appreciate appreciate right. the courtesy. Let me then ask you this. If uh, one of your complaints is uh, service, the NCTA has just suggested new service quality requirements for local systems and suggested that the franchising authorities could enforce them. Doesn't this, in effect, undercut uh, your claim that you're helpless to change the cable system's behavior during the franchise term? No, Congressman, simply because uh, what they've uh, recommended at this late date uh, is simply window dressing. And if you were to look at our franchise, you'd see that the authorities that we have to make sure that the service that is being provided will be provided are much more stringent than what they are recommending under their guidelines. Yeah, well, let me take it a step farther then. Uh, Section 632 of the Cable Act specifically grants authority to cities, quote, to require as part of a franchise, including a franchise renewal subject to Section 626, provisions for enforcement of customer service requirements of the, of the uh, cable operator. Later in the same section, the states and the cities are expressly permitted to enact consumer protection laws. Uh, and after reading that section, I'm uh, puzzled about your claim that, uh, first of all, uh, you don't like what they've proposed, and secondly, no. why haven't you taken no, any no, action? We, we have. In fact, uh, the standards that we've set uh, were grandfathered into the franchise that we currently have. And the standards that they're proposing are, st are good standards. Don't misunderstand me. But the standards that they're proposing are window dressing, in essence, because what we do have are standards that are much more stringent than what, what they're recommending. And the service standards for one community may be very different from others. Now, there are guidelines you need to set, and, and I agree with that. And I'm, I commend the, the industry for coming out with those standards, but this is uh, 1990, and uh, they should have come out with some of these standards back in 84. All right, maybe I agree with you there, but uh, they can't be good and they can't be window dressing at the same time. You said... Well, they are because window dressing does look good sometimes, Congressman. Well, do you think... Are you satisfied with what you've done in Laredo under uh, Section uh, 632? I think that, that we continue to strive to, to provide the best quality cable service to our community and we have monitored it very carefully. Uh, we're not satisfied, and I don't think anyone is when you're trying to do a good job because you can always get better at what you want to do. But I feel that, that with us losing a lot of that authority under our franchise, under the Cable Act of 1984, and the industry being able to use it as a shield uh, to, pr to not provide the service that's required by the franchise, I think is, is not uh, effective and does not serve the public in the end. Uh, Mr. Mooney, would you like to respond to that? Well, I don't agree that our standards are window dressing. Uh, they, they're, well, he they're also said they were good. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, they, they require things like that you answer the phone within 30 seconds, that you have encounter a busy signal no more than 3% of the time, that describes number of hours which not, should not be exceeded in order to roll a truck to fix it if it's broke. But I simply make the point that the mayor also seems to be saying that they recognize they have the authority to do these things themselves. Uh, and and uh, if, if that is the case, and I think it is, then that shouldn't be a problem here, should it? I mean, Absolutely. if they got the authority under the act to do it, I don't know what we're arguing about here. All right, well, let me move on to the other part of the equation. He also mentioned rates. Now, there's some members of Congress that want to re-regulate cable rates. Let's assume uh, for pur purposes of discussion here that a re-regulation bill uh, gets put on the table very seriously over in the House here. Should we go back to the pre-cable scheme and uh, regulate only the rates for reception of broadcast signals? Or should we go farther and regulate the entire basic cable service tier? Why or why not? <coughs> It would be our preference uh, not that, to re -regulate yeah, that, that you go, don't go back and re-regulate anything. I think cable programming, notwithstanding the great strides it has taken, is still a developing industry. And I'd pick up where Mr. Hogan uh, left off, which was that if you re-regulate the cable satellite services, you're going to choke off investment in that most expansionary area of television. I think the real question here is, 
you know, this word competition gets thrown around back and forth, but we never quite wrestle it down to the ground and say what we mean. The critical question would seem to me, are there things available out there which operate as a check on cable pricing and cable penetration? And I think that in our business experience, uh, the answer is yes. The more broadcast signals you got out there, the less people feel that they need to buy cable and the more of a check you've got on both. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Bauscher. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Several mentions were made uh, during opening statements and uh, during uh, initial questions concerning the effect that uh, the new Sky Cable system might have uh, in providing competition uh, to existing cable services. And, and Mr. Mooney, I'd like to get you to comment on that a bit if you would. Let me start by saying that my suspicion is that the Sky Cable service will actually not be offered in those areas that are presently served by the cable industry. Uh, and I wonder if you would uh, either confirm or deny that. Oh, I, 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 I think we should be so lucky. You know, I, I think there's no way that's going to happen. You have some very, you've got a technology that works. You have very deep pockets players, world-class deep pockets players, GE and GM behind this. You have people who are uh, intimately and deeply involved in the, in the television programming business, NBC, which is the leading network, Fox, which is the new fourth network, the Fox Studios, which is one of the most important motion picture houses uh, in the country, uh, the Dolan Cablevision com uh, Company, one of the most important of the cable programming companies. I think that they will uh, make a go of this. I think that high power K-band DBS will be for real. And with a footprint that would cover the entire country, I don't know how those people responsibly, simply in relation to their shareholders, could restrict, restrict their distribution activities only to the so-called white areas. Well, I'm really encouraged to hear that response because uh, that is uh, somewhat of a departure from past practice where the cable industry has been very reluctant to compete with itself. Uh, the history we've seen to date is that uh, various regions have been carved up and are presently served by a sole provider. Uh, that's why you have overbills and only a handful of instances around the country today. But uh, given the presence of Cablevision as one of the participants in this venture, uh, my initial assumption was that uh, the intention of this uh, joint venture was to serve only the white areas, which is a, more than half the country, I might add, so there's quite a market there to be served. But you're telling us uh, uh, without hesitation, that can, the intention. Can I just ask, this is, this is being broadcast across the country. What do you mean by white areas? Because it's. Uh, I, I thank the chairman for that. Uh, uh, a white area is an area that uh, is not served by cable television, uh, where where there where there presently is not uh, that av that availability. Something like 54 percent of uh, homes in the United States are served by cable today. Uh, 85% of homes in the United States are passed, are by, passed cable, by cable, but the service uh, only goes to a little over 50% of the country. So that leaves uh, about 46% of the country. Uh, that could be the target uh, for this new venture. But I'm very encouraged to hear your oh, suggestion I, I, that I, there is uh, every intention on the part of Cablevision in particular to allow its programming to go into the markets already served by cable in effect to be in competition with those existing cable providers. Well, I think that, I, with all respect, I, I suppose that company, if it has its wits about it, and I, suppose, and I have no reason to believe that it doesn't, will not only be after that 46% of homes which don't subscribe to cable, but probably will be after the 56% of homes which now do. I, I, I should say also, Mr. Boucher, however, I think this is additional competition rather than the emergence of, of, of original competition. I think we complete, compete white, quite fiercely now uh, with, with the broadcasters, and anybody in the business uh, will tell you that. Well, Mr. Mooney, I hope that your prediction proves to be accurate. I, I still am going to maintain a healthy skepticism about uh, whether or not the presently served areas are going to be served by this new venture. I'd like to turn to uh, our representatives of uh, local government for a moment. Uh, so far, the discussion that we've had, uh, both in terms of statements and questions, uh, has primarily related to the potential for a return to rate regulation. And as I suggested in my statement, I think there's uh, another alternative, and one that I think offers broader opportunities 
uh, in terms of new services, in terms of rate control, but also in terms of modernizing the national telecommunications infrastructure uh, than mere rate regulation would provide, and that is through the offering of competition, uh, through allowing telephone companies to provide cable television service. Uh, Mr. Barrett, you are representing today uh, the Association of uh, Local Rate Regulators. Uh, could you give us your view on whether or not uh, it would be appropriate to have telephone companies freed to offer cable television service? All right. Well, first, first of all, let me just say, Congressman, we, uh, the National Association of Telecommunication Officers and Advisors, appreciate all your input and in, in your sponsorship of your bill, which I think has really helped break open the cable legislation that we're seeing now. So we really appreciate that. Uh, NATOA supports the National uh, League of Cities policy on telco entry subject to appropriate regulatory conditions and safeguards. I believe that there is a... Obviously could, could you tell us what that policy is uh, for the benefit of those who may not be aware of it? That basically, that basically we, we believe in, in, in competition and that you, we should have telephone entry in. Thank you. Okay, basically at this point in time, uh, Congressman and members of the committee, it's our feeling that uh, telephones probably has a very good chance of competing with that market, and Natoa obviously would be very interested in working with this committee to see that it's done. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Uh, Gentlemen's time has expired. Time has expired. I Thank apologize. Um, the uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ritter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I, I just want to inquire about a, a point that I think is important, and, and may, maybe we're missing it here. But if 57 percent of households have cable, many of those signing up since deregulation, but more importantly, if, if 85 percent of households are passed, doesn't that lead, leave open a tremendous market that cable companies might wish to, to get into? Um, and therefore need to be reasonably priced in order to get into it. I, Mr. Kimmelman, you might want to. Well, Mr. Ritter, as, as you'll probably recall in discussions of the 84 Act, a lot of us were led to believe that rates would not go up uh, and that there would be greater competition. And in cable effort to expand itself and attract subscribers, they would have to offer low prices. Um, that hasn't occurred. Uh, and what we found is that cable has, has recognized that by packaging the over-the-air networks along with other programming that is very popular, it offers a product that is unique and different than what can be found over the air and from any other source at this time with their control of the programming. And so uh, educational programming is on cable, and a lot of, of children in schools need to see that. Uh, if you want access to more movies, you need cable. And so down the line, people feel that it's important to their daily lives, and they only have one source, and so they'll pay. Does, do, you, do you want to try that, uh, Mr. Robbins? Yes, Mr. Ritter, I would. I, I appreciate the perception that people can't live without cable yeah, that Mr. Kimmel I mean, has given I, I wanted me. to say a, point, a word about that. In, in the information overload age, and I think that's what we're facing, uh, we're facing more information uh, what was that? Except for sign up. <laughs> <laughs> except, except for uh, my colleague here says, except for Mr. Sinar does not face an overlook. Uh -huh. yeah. um, uh, it just seems to me that the <laughs> I'm not sure I, I, I might have been out of the room or out of it entirely. <laughs> See, you know. I appreciate the contribution. Uh, the whole point is we're trying to get from ESPN a... into Washington, D.C. so he can watch o University of Oklahoma match to the NCAA title this year. And that's uh, what uh, <laughs> you know, and, and okay. that additional information All is right. what he's right. seeking. Well, may maybe the cable industry can do something about Mr. Sinai's problem. I, reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman. Um, <laughs> Mr. Robbins, would you like to reply? I'm not sure what your question was, but I wanted to make. <laughs> I, uh, isn't there an enormous? I'm not sure either. You, I, I, I think that you, uh, you, you were remarking as I was remarking that Mr. Kimmelman has attributed to us uh, an almost uh, uh, a quality that we can't live without. The American people cannot live without uh, cable television, and you pointed out by your statistics that 45 percent or 46 percent seem to get along pretty well um, without it. That's obviously an issue that we 
in the industry are trying to overcome every day. I think really what is the issue is programming and service. It is not an issue of pricing that gets people mad at their cable companies. It's lousy service. And that is an issue that, as I said, we are addressing. And we at Cox two years ago went into a massive program to do this. And we can see the results now in happier customers and more customers. And that's the right way to run the business on a long-term basis. I would just reiterate that uh, what Mr. Hogan said and what Mr. Mooney touched on, uh, and that is that if you start to venture in the area of re-regulation of satellite services, it will indeed choke off the development and creation of programming uh, that has been so vital to the development of this industry, but more importantly to the diversity and choice of the American people, particularly in the last five years since, since the Act. I'd like to touch for a moment on the so-called the, the price increases, the impact of the 1989 CPI figures. Um, and also the relationship of price to cost. Uh, we seem sometimes to forget that, that sometimes if, if, if a price increases, there may be something else offered within that price in, in, a, in addition to just uh, the encompassed greed. But uh, Gene, if you want to comment on that, and then I'd like Jim Mooney to comment. Well, it's uh, what is, what is the as I mentioned before, the cable operators define what is the package called basic. And they will increase prices and sometimes offer more channels. The uh, consumer doesn't really have a choice. If it's, is if it's basic. The, in your mind, then, is the, and, and I, I think I hear some agreement. In your mind, then, the, the problem is packaging and not necessarily uh, price? Well, it's a combination, Congressman Ritter, because the market data show that the actual costs to the cable company of serving each subscriber are somewhere between six and nine hundred dollars. The marketplace value of the subscribers has been ranging between two and three thousand dollars. Those in, those clearly demonstrate monopoly profits way beyond what reasonably competitive firms earn in the no, marketplace. If I just, Mr. Chen Chairman, just just on that point, because I, I think I think your your uh, calculation uh, on the per subscriber value and how it has been arrived at is not necessarily acceptable in the, in the intellectual sense and, and value of uh, cable companies, I think, are, 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 are quite different from uh, the way you've calculated. I think it's mostly on cash flow. It's the kind of changes that have happened in the industry. And we can get back to that later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Ox. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Robbins, I was, uh, uh, my interest was piqued when you mentioned that uh, your uh, management uh, comp your management's compensation is tied into improved uh, service uh, standards. Could you uh, tell us how that works? Our uh, structure of compensating our general managers involves a base salary and a bonus uh, on top of the base salary and a portion of the bonus, in fact, an increasing portion of the bonus this year over last year um, is uh, is is evaluated on the basis of how well this individual performs on 21 different customer service variables, including a customer service survey that we do, response times on the telephone, uh, et cetera. I mean, it's a fairly elaborate process that we go through to basically inculcate in our culture that our customer is our number one objective. Well, are you unique in the industry? Kyle? No, sir. No, sir. I don't think we are. Is that, Mr. Mooney, could you, uh, are, are there several uh, companies uh, that, uh, that follow that same type of procedure? Increasingly so, yes. In increasingly, uh, companies are including in the annual reviews of their managers uh, criteria such as customer service, but also including community relations. Uh, which uh, is is uh, rapidly uh, coming to being seen in our industry as a critical part of our business. And Mr. Kimmel, that sounds like a pretty po a positive response to uh, a lot of the complaints that we've received, and I'm sure you've received. And, yes. And uh, it appears to be a lot more than window dressing. Uh, I wonder if you'd care to comment as to uh, that trend, and if in fact it's a positive trend. Well, we we do see it as a positive trend, but it, unfortunately, and, and voluntary actions are always welcome by by consumers. Um, I, I, I would just I just mention that I think if you found any telephone company with the service uh, problems that a, a 
a cable company had, uh, you know, they probably wouldn't be in existence anymore. We would never tolerate that in our telephone system. And it, it's nice to see the cable companies responding. But what it indicates, the fact that all this has had to happen under pressure from legislation indicates to me there's not enough market pressure on the cable industry to respond to customer complaints. I hope this will continue. Uh, and, and if it takes political pressure, then, then so be it. Certainly a, a welcome development. More welcome than re-regulation? Well, re-regulation really responds to a problem with the prices being excessive and, and the earnings being excessive in relationship to the costs. Um, exactly what would need to be done in terms of re-regulating services is much more complicated in terms of quality. Uh, we would like to see more competitive pressure because we think that's the best way of, of, of getting the cable industry to respond to customer complaints. Mr. Kimmel, as you know, the Senate's been uh, looking at this uh, issue as well, and there is a proposal over there that would allow the, uh, mm. the uh, cable operators to raise rates for basic service by a certain percentage uh, uh, annually without having to go to the franchisor for, uh, for a decision. Uh, do you support that, uh, that concept? Well, we, I guess I, I'd like to come at it from a little different angle. We support the concept of evaluating whether there really is competition or not. We certainly don't believe there is. The cable industry thinks there is. Let's just subject it to careful scrutiny. If there's not competition, we think there should be a limit price set, uh, possibly using an index, uh, setting, using, looking at some generalized cost data. Uh, in response to many of the comments that, that you made this morning, we don't want to see some complicated regulatory scheme develop. Let's keep it simple, but let's just make sure it's got a, a cap price that is at a reasonable level. Well, that's interesting that uh, you've come to this committee before, though, and opposed uh, price caps yes. for the telephone companies, uh, and yet you support them for uh, apparently for cable. Is there some inconsistency there? That well, I, I hope there's not. Um, as, as you have told us, you define cable as not a common carrier in the 84 Act. Uh, telephone companies are common carriers. Telephone companies have traditionally been rate-based regulated, uh, looking at costs and profits. Cable companies sporadically were, but not consistently. And now they're not regulated at all, virtually, anywhere in the country. So we're looking for a way of doing something simple that helps the consumer without having to go through a, a complicated bureaucracy. It, it, the, the difference, I believe, is where we are now in terms of these two industries. Well, it strikes me that we were talking about monopolies and monopolies here. I mean, we're talking about telephone monopolies, and you've indicated that you feel that, and other witnesses have indicated that cable is indeed a monopoly. Uh, and it's, it's, I think it's a little difficult to ask this committee or the Congress uh, to, uh, to try to, to treat these, if indeed they are monopolies, uh, differently when we're talking about rate regulation. Well, we'd like it subjected to, to careful scrutiny as to whether it is a monopoly. Uh, I don't think it's, it is nearly as, as monopolistic as the phone company in one important sense. There is partial competition to aspects of cable service. I agree with Mr. Mooney. There's some pressure from outside. We don't see that in, in the local telephone area. But it, it, it's, a, it's pragmatically a, a political decision on your part. Uh, we would like to see some restrictions put in place. We think if there is a monopoly found, it ought to include regulatory oversight of, of what the profits are to make sure they're only reasonable. So in that sense, it's totally parallel to what we ask of telephone uh, monopolies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. McMillan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had a quick question um, listening to this and this debate, one of my first times. Uh, it seems that there um, is a, uh, a desire to see some legislative approaches taken, either a lifeline that uh, the chairman talked about, uh, infusion of more competition or possible re-regulation of this industry. Mr. Murray, if you had to choose between opening the doors, if you will, and allowing others to get into this industry uh, in the near term or having rate re-regulation and other forms of re-regulation, obviously, I mean, I'd be curious as to your comments uh, on, that, on that matter. Well, I, I don't, I don't want to seem to be evading your question. I, I have to say that, that, that we do not see the same barriers to entry as other people apparently do. I mean, we don't, by and large, for example, hold exclusive cable franchises. They can grant more franchises anytime they, 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 uh, they feel like it. You've just seen the announcement of uh, Sky Cable, which is entry into the, generically the same business we're in, which is subscription television. Uh, you've got MMDS operators springing up around the country, and they, they claim they have a, a, a problem with access to programming, but I frankly think their problem 
uh, has more to do with being over leveraged uh, than it does uh, in being shut off from the programming. That's what the microband people say. Uh, I think that if we had to make that choice, uh, we'd probably uh, come down in, in favor of competition, if only because of our historical experience of being suppressed openly by the federal government in favor of broadcasting uh, for a period of 20 years. And we're quite well aware that you, know, you can't suppress the alternative technology forever. Technology will out. And so, with, so will competition. A comment on that. In Anne Arundel County, there were multiple franchises for a number of years. And we've never really had the kind of rate problems, although we've had some that I guess others have experienced. But I guess my, my point that I was trying to make is that I, you really view re-regulation as the most onerous of the options and that uh, you would much prefer uh, competition, uh, albeit uh, that's, that's that's not defined, but more competition into the industry over any form of sure. But it's 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 it it does unfortunately get to be a little bit uh, more complicated than that as a simple political matter. I don't see the Congress about to overturn either the single franchise system, which really was a creation of the cities, not us, or nor do I see the Congress ab about to overturn the ability of the cities to extract from us a lot of econ uneconomic commitments, starting with 5 percent of our gross revenues <coughs> and going down through all, all the other freebies. As a political matter, that's not going to happen. So I think the degree to which one can expect the existing regulatory structure uh, to be changed overnight are quite limited. And I think you have to understand, too, that, that, that people are going to want some comfort that abuses are capable of being checked. And, and, if, and if I understand where probably a majority of this committee may be today, I, I think that that, that that view is probably shared by quite a number of people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time <coughs> has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Schaefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kimmelman, on uh, page 13 of your testimony, and it's been remarked a couple times that uh, a 50 percent reduction in rate could save six billion dollars a year. Six yes. billion. Yes. A lot of money. Yes, it is. There's uh, approximately 53 million homes, to my understanding, that's uh, uh, on cable now, and uh, that if indeed uh, my calculations are right, a uh, six billion dollar reduction would uh, mean a, a rate of about ten dollars per month per home, which would, uh, on an average, a rate basis of $15, meaning that they would be charged $5 uh, a month. Uh, do you feel that uh, cable could actually operate and give service and everything in $5 a month? I don't follow your calculations, Mr. Schaefer, but... Um, um, well, I don't follow yours either, Mr. Kimmel. Well, Where do you uh, come up with $6 billion? Well, the, the, uh, in response to, to your question and Mr. Ritter's, um, this is using Tobin's Q ratios accepted by economists for evaluating whether there is market power in a particular industry. Uh, numerous of, it, it, we cite our sources, there are numerous economists that have used these to evaluate cable. It's a $14 billion industry. Uh, and uh, that's where the $6 billion figure comes from. This is from overall cable revenues. And uh, looking at it in gross national terms, we calculate that rates could br be brought down um, by 50 percent, which is um, actually could be up more than $6 billion. But looking conservatively, we, we use that figure. Uh, with full infusion of competition. What the, what the Tobin's key ratios uh, indicate is that the sale price of cable systems today in the marketplace demonstrates that purchasers believe they can extract that amount of revenue out of the customer base in those communities. That's looking at the current subscribers. Uh, it's looking at current market conditions without regulation. Uh, and that's where that, the basis of that estimation. Now, there may be other ways of evaluating market power. We're certainly open to them. Um, and we'd be open to other, uh, other economists looking at it. Mr. Moody, do you want to comment on that? Yes. You know, I've been fascinated by the $6 billion figure and spent some time yesterday chasing around trying to figure out where Mr. Kimmelman comes up with this. And as best I can tell, it's, it's the position being taken by Mr. Kimmelman is that to the degree the market value of an up and running business exceeds the replacement cost of the hard assets, they've got to be taking monopoly profit. 
and, bec and, and, and I think if you believe that, then you believe you can buy a broadcast station for the replacement value of the transmitter and that you can buy Macy's for the replacement value of the mannequins and cash registers. I mean, that bears no relationship to what actually goes on in the world. We have asked Professor Grossman at the Wharton School, who I understand is a pretty heavy name in the world of economics, to write a paper, which we're today submitting to the FCC, and I'll be happy to submit to this committee too, analyzing the use of Q ratio analysis to this situation. And, and Professor Grossman's unambiguous conclusion is that it's meaningless and that they're misapplying a technique primarily intended to analyze entry and exit motivations for markets by firms, but that it doesn't have anything to do with monopoly power or monopoly prices. Well, I would just uh, go a little bit further, and we're talking not just six billion period, we're talking about six billion per year. And, uh, and I would uh, ask the chair uh, if we might get a complete detailed synopsis how Mr. Kimmelman comes up with his $6 billion per year over a period of time because I can see personally no way how in the world this could work. I uh, would like to ask Mr. Barra, you indicated that uh, since 84, if I'm not mistaken, your cable rates have increased 79%. The oh. GAO report said on an average it was 26 percent. Uh, what is that in dollars since 84? In, in terms of our rate increase? The 79 percent since 84 to now. Since it's been uh, 86, Congressman, for us. Oh, I, I misunderstood you. I thought no, it was we hadn't even granted 84. a franchise until April of 84. Well, how, what are we talking about in dollars? I, I want to get away from percents. Dollars are more important. Congressman, I, I don't have that information. What you don't know what it, what the uh, rate was in '86? And my rate in '86 was nine. Okay. Okay. All right. If you're asking about the city of St. Louis, yeah, I just I, you indicated that you've had a 79 percent increase. I'd like to know what it is in dollars. Okay. In de in December of '84 to December of '85. When we granted the franchise, and again, the city of St. Louis worked in a cooperative effort with the industry, with our cable operator, in determining uh, basic rates. Uh, that rate was 9.45. It stayed that way until December of '86. Uh, however, I, I do want to state though that we did not have um, one customer online until May of '85 in our one franchise area, and. June of 85 in our, in our second franchise area. What is your rate now? Our rate right now is 1523. So 1523, so that so, is... Which is a 61, which would be a 61 percent rate increase since 86. But 79 since 84. Yeah, I'm just trying to find out... What's in that? Increase well, I, I was well. I was going to get to that. Okay. Uh, and uh, how many more channels are provided? Uh, uh, what type of services has been? In the city uh, of St. Louis, since the original programming package took place, we've had an additional six basic channels included. Uh, we've gone from 32 channels uh, to, to 38. Uh, I should note, though, that we've also Please, you can uh, that, that you we've can also had some discussions with our cable operator. Uh, the city was quite concerned about a couple of channels that we ha have uh, lost as well that uh, the consumers wanted to, wanted to keep. I would just comment, Mr. Chairman, that the average cost is approximately $15, so Gentle you're not above it. Gentlemen's time has expired, and pursuant to the gentleman from Colorado's request, we'll ask Mr. Kimmelman and Mr. Mooney if you could uh, submit to the subcommittee uh, all of the uh, eye-watering analysis that both of your economists uh, <laughs> would uh, want us to consider in uh, trying right. to assess this the is, validity of stuff. the two approaches which you've taken. <laughs> um, gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. I thank the chair. I would first like to ask unanimous consent that Mayor Ramirez be allowed two minutes to respond to Mr. Mooney's claims about what did or did not happen in Laredo. He had wanted the re time earlier and I would hope it would be all right with the committee. The subcommittee has heard the gentleman from Tennessee's unanimous consent request. Uh, Mr. Chair, if 
gentleman, gentleman from I'd like uh, to use the two minutes of his time I'd be, I'd be happy to, uh, to allow that it seems only fair is the gentleman objecting to the request of Mr. Ramirez, a first-time witness before this committee, to defend his own community? I, would, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't do that to my friend from Tennessee, but it seems to me it only fair that uh, if, you, if you wanted him to respond, you could do it on your own question. Notwithstanding what may, what may be fair, uh, in the absence of an objection uh, from any member of the subcommittee, Mr. Ramirez, you'll be recognized for two minutes to respond to any you, comments you have. Um, wanted to make a point uh, on I appreciate own. that and thank you Congressman, for the opportunity uh, mr. Mooney I'm glad made his statements uh, saying if his information was correct uh, we received 2.3 million dollars from Paragon cable and and if you look at my testimony on page 13 it refers to the actual track transaction that took place Paragon in es essence went from community to community uh, wanting to get this deal closed in Wall Street. They came to Laredo, Texas and said, we don't accept some of the terms that are under your franchise, and to take these terms out of your franchise, we're going to pay you $2.3 million. And that was it. Now, as far as uh, Mr. Mooney stating the, the fact that our rates went up 258 percent, and he stated it quite uh, appropriately in saying that in order for the cable consumer to stay on cable, they had to pay the additional 258 percent when the re-tiering was taken off the system. So, and the money was not spent to build uh, a police station. Uh, the money was set aside, $800,000 of it was set aside to assure public access because we have three public access channels within our community and that is set aside to generate operating funds and the other fund has not been uh, appropriated by the City Council at this time for any other endeavor. Thank you. The uh, time for, uh, that was granted on the unanimous consent request has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman could, from in Tennessee. In fairness, could you, make, could you note on the record I don't concede the 258 percent simply because I don't know? That will be noted on the record. The, the gentleman from Tennessee is now recognized on his own time. Thank you, Chair. We've had a very civilized hearing so far, and I think it has largely masked the deep anger that many, many Americans feel about cable rates and cable service. A good way to summarize it is, in my opinion, the folks I talk to back home are mad as hell and they don't want to take it anymore. We have conducted this hearing, however, in a much more subdued fashion, so I don't want anyone to mistake our lack of real passion underneath our remarks. The voluntary standards that cable has come up with, I think it's worth a look very closely at what they really involve. They're to be in place by July of 1991, which means if Mr. Kimmelman's figures are correct, that if we just pay them another nine or ten billion dollars more, they'll behave for us. That's the reverse side of these voluntary standards. I think most Americans are shocked that cable industry hadn't offered any of these guidelines or any of these standards before, and that really there were no standards, and you could get a busy signal all day long or all week long or all month long and there was nothing they could do about it. In fact, the general cable attitude is they don't want to hear from local governments, even if it's the second poorest SMSA in America, even if they're Spanish language speakers, and they depend vitally on that cable outlet. And who's going to pay for these new service improvements? Cable customers, plus a markup and a profit. Are these new services going to be taken out of cable profits today, there's no guarantee of that. They can charge anything they want to plus a profit for these service improvements. So is the consumer public really being given much with these voluntary guidelines? Look at the footnote. Not only has cable gone out of its way to strangle most rural television viewers and their satellite dish connection, now cable is clearly saying if you live in a town of less than 10,000 people, it's not worth their time or trouble to keep up with whether the people are being properly served. I don't want to write off small town America. I'm prejudiced. It's most of my district. But I think it's that sort of arrogance that makes people terribly upset with the cable companies. These are voluntary guidelines. Hey, guys, there's no teeth. There are not even any gums in this sort of procedure. Let's not fool ourselves. These guidelines have so many loopholes, there's barely enough safeguard in there to hold the loopholes together. This is a Swiss cheese set of safeguards. And it seems to me that it's 
probably part of the cable industry's end game strategy, some of which was revealed in a leaked memo that Communications Daily reported on earlier, that the strategy is to keep the House calm, to confuse the Senate and the FCC with statistics, and to make sure that their PAC is overfunded. Well, I hope people across America realize that that's not an exceptional strategy. That's fairly typical of Washington procedures. But I don't think the American people like lobbying groups carrying on in that fashion. I can't help but think that if Sam Walton or the whoever owns Kmart and these other alternatives in rural areas, in towns of less than 10,000 people, had been in charge of the cable industry, we'd see a lot better service. Those folks know how to compete on very slim profit margins. They know how to deliver quality service, good merchandise, in the remotest corners of this land and still make a lot of money and still provide service enhancements. We're told we have to be monopolies before we can hope to serve our people. That's the Soviet idea. That's the Soviet system. You gentlemen have shown such a disdain for democracy, at least as expressed in our form of city councils and county commissions. I find it shocking. And I also find that you've shown a disdain for our free system of competition in this country. You have become so dependent on state-sanctioned monopoly that I don't think you know a way to compete without it. I would suggest instead of a piecemeal measure, such as a lifeline set up here or there, let's divide the country in half. Let's make half of it competitive and see where the rates fall. Let's make the other half the status quo side of the country. You might even have Americans voting with their feet to get on the free side of the country. <laughs> Let's endorse some good old-fashioned American values. Let's have real competition and see whether these Q ratios or not are correct. Let's put these programs to a business test as businessmen should want to do not as creatures of a state-sanctioned monopoly. A lot of slick arguments can be made to defend making tons of money. You can hire the best talent on the face of the earth, but it doesn't alter the fact that you are still defending or trying to defend the indefensible. And that's why I feel that so many consumers across the country are not only upset now, they're going to be upset, and that's why this is the number one consumer issue and why we need to take real action on it not window dressing, not a Band-Aid here or there, but real action to get real competition this year. Sorry it was a statement, Mr. Chairman, but I had limited time. Thank, Thank you. you. Recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Richardson. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Ramirez? Yes. <clears throat> when you contacted the cable, operator, the, uh, the cable operator to express your concern about these program practices, what what was the response? And let me be specific. As I understand it, 94% of uh, the population speaks Spanish as their language of choice. And you're talking about that uh, in your testimony that subscribers without cable-ready tel television sets now must pay $5.50 additional on top of the existing $17 fee for basic cable if they want to receive all three Spanish language channels. So. If consumers in Laredo must pay $22.50 if they want that variety of Spanish language uh, programming, is that correct? Pardon? I'm sorry, Congressman. The, the question was, do they prefer? Uh, the 22, $22.50, yes. is that a correct figure? No, the $17.50 uh, is a correct figure. Is there a lifeline rate in Laredo? No, sir. Discount? No, sir. And when you contacted your uh, cable operator about these programming problems, what, what was their response? Well, this is in essence what took place, Congressman. Uh, after they finally answered the phone, uh, the new company that came in went and took out two of the most popular stations that carries news in Spanish, which is essential uh, to a lot of the people in Laredo, and switched those two stations to the upper tiers. And if they didn't have cable ready sets, these people, and particularly the, particularly the elderly, who are, are really a, a big percentage of these uh, Spanish speaking population that we have in, in Laredo because of our proximity to the border, uh, were forced to go out there. They couldn't, they, if you can imagine from one day to the next, uh, 
someone going up there turning on their TV to catch their favorite newscast in Spanish, and it's no longer there. They've got an advertising channel on it. Okay? They moved it up, uh, and at the same time, at the height of this, when the biggest outcry that we've had in, in as well, as far as I can recall, of, of consumer outcry against uh, cable abuse, they went out and changed the phone number. And they, couldn't, and they couldn't get the phone system uh, uh, working right for about two months till everything settled down. And so in essence, uh, those are the kind of uh, abuses that we see that we cannot control at this time. Let me ask Jim Mooney. Uh, I know the industry has been concerned about the customer service. What, what is the industry doing within NCTA internally to try to improve this customer service? Uh, well, the, the primary thing we have done is to pull together a group of our operations executives uh, to come up with these customer service standards. And the reason we wanted the operations people to do it was not only because we wanted them to be highly specific, but also wanted to make sure that we were logistically capable of doing it. Uh, we also intend to issue or make available a seal of good customer service, which will be available to operators who both certify to us that they meet the standards, but also, most important, agree to report annually to their local franchising authorities on their compliance with, with the standards. We're, we're, we're trying to deliver this up, as it were, on a platter uh, to, to the local governments who, as Mayor Ramirez has suggested, do have the power to engage in enforcing these kinds of things. Uh, we also, I should add, have cable labs working on a variety of projects uh, intended to improve simply the consumer friendliness of some of the equipment we put in people's houses and, and, and which frankly in some instances has been a little confusing even, even to people like me uh, who, who are not terribly technologically oriented. I, I should add, Mr. Richardson, that there is a move in the industry also to recreate some of these lower priced <coughs> lifeline tiers which were eliminated in, in, in the wake of deregulation and, which, and, and whose er, uh, elimination, I understand, has caused some, some problems in a number of your districts. Now, Mr. Kimmelman, you know I have a lot of respect for you and uh, I just want to ask you some consumer-related questions. First of all, uh, Mr. Cooper's assertion, would you agree that this is the most important consumer issue facing uh, the consumer uh, in the in this Congress, I've um, I've made the statement a few times that as I see the the political force behind this, that this is the the most important consumer issue in this area that has a likelihood of uh, being addressed by this Congress. It seems to me that there is there is a groundswell of of concern about cable, uh, and it has been registered in both the Senate and the House. Uh, all of you have been hearing. Uh, and that the defense is clearly inadequate, uh, regardless of what economists are, are hired, we'll be happy to respond to them. Uh, the public knows how much uh, rates have gone up, and they know how poor the quality of service is, and they want to see something done about it. Uh, so I, I think I, I, my, my statement is that this is the most important issue that, that we really see a likelihood of some action on. Gene, let's explore that. Mr. Chairman, if I could just, I won't, won't ask him a question, but I will just make a statement to Gene, uh, maybe he can respond in writing, and that deals with a bill I had on Syndex, which extended the uh, FCC decision to an another year because of the concern that I had that what was happening is that local viewers would get blacked out. And I'd like you to respond to me as to whether you to. think this is a consumer issue. Sure, certainly. The gentleman's time has expired, and we'll insert Mr. Kelman's written response in the record. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Scheuer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Moody, you <coughs> just heard an impassioned, angry outburst from the normally very cerebral, very cool, very calm uh, Mr. Cooper of Tennessee. <coughs> and he's, t he's talking. I think he speaks to many of the members around here about more than tinkering, more than addressing occasional abuse. I think he's talking about a major look-see at the whole institutional structure that we're facing on regulating cable television, the rates and everything else. 
Would you like me to yield you the balance of my time to answer Mr. Cooper? Take us to the mountaintop and sort of give us a philosophical view of how the cable industry ought to meet this apparently widespread anger and dissatisfaction about the structural arrangement between cable television and its consumers across the country. You're very gracious, Mr. Scheuer. Uh, thank you for the, for the opportunity. Um, I conveyed to Mr. Cooper prior to the hearing that the press report uh, which concerned him and which seems to suggest that uh, we were on the edge of engaging in something approaching vote buying in this place was an inaccurate report based on an inaccurate memorandum put together by an unnamed source uh, at, at, at one of our board meetings. And, and as somebody who uh, has been associated with this institution, either inside of it or outside of it, for over 20 years, uh, I not only uh, reject such practices, but, but frankly get a little upset when people loosely, and I think without full appreciation of the gravity of the suggestion, start tossing that kind of thing around in a hearing of this kind. Now, as to your invitation to talk, to, to talk from the mountaintop, as it were, I think if you look at television and the way the television industries have developed in the last decade, uh, you'll see something that's quite interesting. Ten years ago, you basically had ABC, NBC, and CBS. Today you've got ABC, NBC, and CBS, but you've also got cable, you've also got VCRs, you've got an explosion in independent television stations. Uh, you've got a new fourth broadcast network coming online now, Fox, which is encountering its own regulatory problems. And you've got some very deep pockets players, GE, GM, announcing that pretty soon we're also going to have direct broadcast satellites. Now the trend, unmistakably, therefore, has been expansive. You got more players, you got more programming, you got more choice. And I don't really know of any reason, notwithstanding the complaints that have been made by competitors against us in these hearings, to believe that that trend is going to be reversed absent the intervention of, of some external force, including potential forms of regulation. And while it's not our position, and never has been our position, that you should have a static regulatory requirement which never gets changed. You know, adjustments are, are, are happen all the time. That's the way this country works. I think you've got to be very careful about doing things which even inadvertently could change the general trend and tend to make things start to contract more than they expand. And I think that in making those judgments, you also have to take seriously the proposition that not, just about everybody uh, who comes in front of these committees has some uh, special axe to grind, whether it's mine because I represent an industry or Mr. Barra's because he's in the business of regulating things and would like to regulate them some more, or when the broadcasters show up and, 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 and they claim to be for a level playing field, but I think what they're really for is to recapture their viewing share, or for that matter, other people who see that we've essentially validated the subscription television business and want to use politics to get a piece of it. I mean, nobody's altogether right or altogether wrong in these things, but I think the public interest lies in continuing to expand rather than contract uh, the world of television and, and the number of people who provide it. Do you see, uh, uh, apart from asking us to rely on the expansion, which, which may be very real, and satellite television over a period of time, uh, where there's direct access to homes without the intervention and need for wires, <coughs> cables, whatever, that, that, that may in, inject a great uh, competitive factor into this thing. But in the meantime, uh, can you uh, see any overall, I can conclude, I just want to make a statement, but uh, I would ask, uh, perhaps you'd want to submit a paper, perhaps you've covered this. Uh, do you see any changes that <coughs> the industry could make <coughs> that wouldn't interfere with their basic cash flow or their basic uh, expect reasonable expectation for profit, but that would address some of the broad structural uh, institutional questions which Mr. Cooper addressed. 
Gentlemen's, gentlemen's time has expired and would ask you, Mr. Mooney, if you could to submit that in uh, writing, um, unless you can figure out some other way of injecting into some other question that you're asked uh, in the course of the I'll remain new. alert, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Swift. Thank you, Chair. I've sat here all this time to ask a kind of off-the-wall question, which is I'm wondering from particularly Mr. Hogan and Mr. Robbins why they think they're here. And in order to give you a chance to think about that, let me make a couple of additional remarks. When I came to Congress 12 years ago, the cable industry was the fair-haired boy. They, uh, th those awful people over at the NAB had tried to kill you in your bassinet. Uh, you'd had to wrestle uh, pole attachments away from the grasping utilities. <coughs> who uh, were then and still are to some degree uh, bad guys. But in the intervening 12 years, one would conclude you become a bad guy too. Why do you think you're here? What are the circumstances that brought you to this witness table and this kind of hearing and this level of criticism that is being visited upon you today? Mr. Hogan? Well, uh, Mr. Swift, I appreciate the opportunity to respond. I'm here very simply to, uh, to do two things. One, selfishly, for myself and my stockholders, is to preserve our business, which has been a very aggressive programmer. Forgive me for inter interrupting, but, but I, I guess maybe I didn't state the question right. What do you think caused this hearing to be? And in that sense, why are you here? Why, why are we even asking these kinds of questions? Why is this issue before the Congress, do you think? When a dozen years ago, people really were not only critical of you, they kind of thought of you as the people that were the riding over the hill on the white horse. Well, I think it's, a, to a large extent, caused by, by our own success. We have fulfilled or even exceeded Congress's expectations for the quality and diversity of programming and the broad range of choice that we now make available to cable subscribers. Um, as a result of that broad range, we've become very popular. Um, but in order to underwrite that programming, prices have gone up. I will, uh, as, a, um, as a consumer, admit that there have been times when I have been also frustrated by the service that the individual cable system may provide. And I think that's a part of, of growing and it building a new business. I think that the reason we're here is because there have been some shortfalls in the level of consumer service that uh, uh, customers have expected from their cable operator. And we are, uh, as a result, being given broad, uh, uh, a broad uh, introspection of the entire industry. Do you, uh, do you think it, it just stops with these consumer concerns? That is the, the purpose, the, the topic of this hearing. But do you think that's all that is disturbing Congress? Uh, well, uh, that would be difficult for me to, to answer. I, I, really, I really don't have a good answer for you on that. These, these are. This is a weird question. I understand yeah. that. Mr. Robbins? Uh, Mr. Swift, I, I think there are sort of four critics of our industry, um, among them our customers in certain, and I would say more isolated instances where the industry has not behaved as well as it should have. I think the cities who lost the rate control power in the 1984 Act. I think the broadcasters whose audience share declines uh, each year, and I think the telephone companies who are dying for uh, a way to find more investment because they're going to be... Uh, could, I, could, I, could I reclaim my time from you just because... Yes, sir. I, I, I've got obviously a reason for asking the question. And you managed... I was out at, was it the board of directors meeting or whatever that meeting was that Cable had in California. That was one of the things they said. It's those awful telephone companies running around bad-mouthing us. They've caused all this problem. That's one of the most incredible things I've ever heard, not because the telephone company isn't perfectly capable of bad-mouthing you, but because they're so damn incompetent convincing anybody of anything. <laughs> <laughs> the point that I would suggest you consider is that also what happened in that 12 years is a lot of big guys moved in. Big guys who 
have, in fact, I think, behaved not only in these areas we're talking about here, but in vertical integration and a whole bunch of other things. Building off the incredible success of the NCTA over the years at beating the broadcasters, beating the utilities, beating the, NBC, uh, the NAB, beating the cities. And my experience has always been that they did it fair and square. They outworked, outthought, outplanned, uh, uh, and stayed up later at night to do that. It was all done fair and square. The b bottom line is you guys have so much freedom, you haven't been able to live with it. You haven't been able to be the first corporation or first industry in the history of mankind that could deal with that much success without getting greedy. That's the reason I think you're here. And I think that as you examine the kinds of problems you are, you are having, your own best interest would be not blame it on the telephone company or uh, an odd congressman that wants to be a demagogue or all those kind of things, but look to yourself and see what are you doing differently nowadays than you used to do in terms of your attitude toward the public. In those 12 years, I think a study of the history of the NCTA who was calling the shots then and who's calling the shots now may give you an idea of who is causing you your problems. Look to yourself. I thank you for answering kind of a weird question. <laughs> Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Moorhead. I think Mr. Hogan's right about one thing, that you're a victim of your own successes because you're so important to the vast number of people in, in the United States that you really have become a monopoly because they have no other place to go where they can get that variety of, of entertainment that's available in their home. You have the broadcast stations on the cable. Uh, some people in my area are up against the foothills and out in Palm Springs, uh, in another district out in Palm Springs. They can't get the, the broadcast stations without cable. And so you really are, to them, a monopoly. The thing that concerns me, really, is that people are paying up to $2,500, maybe more, per subscriber. And they're paying this because there is a monopoly. And they know they can raise the prices that they charge to the consumer. And when they can find out they can raise the prices, then it raises the amount that they can sell per, per subscriber the next time around. It, the, the, that phenomena feeds itself. Uh, you, you know, I haven't been a, a basher of cable. I think cable does a good job for the most part. But there, has, there either has to be some real competition, and that doesn't mean three television stations in the community. Uh, that isn't enough when you compare it with 36 to 100 channels that are available on, on cable. Uh, many of us love C-SPAN and ESPN and all of the other things that you have. Somebody has to either be able to oversee the prices or you have to have competition. And I'm sure there will be competition in time. I'm sure the telephone companies will be in there in time, I don't know how long, but others will be. Uh, I don't want to see the city regulate the price this time around, if, the, if there is, because I don't think the cities are prepared to do it. I don't think they're capable of doing it. Some, some of them are, but not all of them. But every monopoly in California really is regulated in some way, if they're a public service organization, by uh, the Public Utilities Commission. And I haven't noticed them hurting the, the telephone companies or hurting the gas companies or the electric power companies. They aren't opposed to people having a reasonable amount of money, putting programming or whatever you need. But the problem is that somebody should have the final voice. I don't think they'll veto all your raises, but I think you have to show them that those raises are justified and have some kind of uniformity that the state would give you that the local cities would not give you. But what's your comment on that? <clears throat> well, Mr. Moorhead, I, I, I acknowledge that you certainly haven't, you know, in any respect, been <coughs> an, an unfair critic of our industry. Uh, oh, and we've known each other for a long time, and, and I know that uh, 
you, you try very hard to take reasonable views on these things. Um, <coughs> let me try to get hold of that, quest the question you put, which is a fairly long question, by just going to this issue of a multi-channel medium such as cable versus broadcast signals. I, I really think that if you want to get a handle on this and understand it, that the analysis has to include more than simply the number of TV stations in a market as compared to the number of channels on the cable system because even though almost invariably there will be fewer TV stations than there are cable channels, you'll see that most of the view viewership still goes to the broadcast stations. I mean, it, d despite the, the, the complaints of the broadcasters, please don't underestimate the commercial power of broadcasting in this country. They are still the dominant form of television in terms of viewership, and while our medium has made great strides, I think in many places, a lot of people feel that they got plenty of off-air TV. Who needs to buy cable? Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, chair recognizes the gentleman <coughs> from the state of Texas, Mr. Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to first thank you for inviting uh, uh, Mayor Ramirez uh, to come and testify today. I'd like to thank him for being here. Get the, I'm sure the award for having traveled the farthest to come. I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, about the question of effective competition. I think this question may have been asked earlier to, to another one of the witnesses, but uh, assuming that there is not effective competition, uh, do you think letting the phone company into the business to compete with the cable companies is a good idea? Well, Congressman, um, that's a, an issue that really needs to be explored quite carefully by the Congress in particular, simply because you're just allowing uh, another monopoly into the system, and it must be a uh, scrutinized quite carefully prior to letting it into the system. It would be pretty much equating it to having the, the fox take care of the hen. And, uh, and so it, it's an alternative that should be explored as a possible source of competition to the cable industry, but one that has to be examined quite carefully by you gentlemen uh, to make sure that the abuses that we are now suffering are not created down the road. Mr. Kimmelman, you may have answered this question already. I've, I've been in another hearing this morning. Uh, we think right, right now the like, telephone companies technologically are not in a position to compete. We need regulation to bring prices down. They have to move to a, a fiber optic system or a broadband capable system in order to compete. So it's many years away. It's very costly to do. And our feeling is there are many risks involved in terms of cross-subsidization that we've uh, had problems with telephone companies in the past. Maybe down the road they will be a viable competitor. Uh, we don't think in the foreseeable future. So the only real solution we see today is to where you find excessive pricing, where you find uh, excessive earnings to uh, have some public officials, whether they be state, local, or, or even at the FCC, intervene and put limits on the prices. The FCC now has a uh, definition of effective competition, which has been uh, criticized as being defective. Uh, uh, understand they're now undertaking an effort to uh, re-examine that definition. First of all, I'd like to ask uh, Mayor Ramirez what you think that definition should be if you've had a chance to formulate an opinion on that. Well, uh, not a, an, an expanded opinion on it, but I think that effective competition um, in this case would be, in essence, um, another uh, transport for uh, broadcasting. I think that um, our... Uh, Anything less than that I don't think would be effective competition <coughs> simply because of the wide variety of viewing that's allowed and, uh, and, and, uh, and provided for by the cable company. So anything short of a similar type of a service uh, I don't think would be effective competition. Mr. Kimmelman? I think it's very simple, Congressman Bryant. It's, uh, there needs to be an alternative to the kinds of things that are packaged together in cable. It can be from different medium. It can be VCR, it can be going to a sporting event, it can be satellite transmission. I'll count whatever Mr. Mooney wants to count, but it has to be the ability to put together something equivalent to what cable offers in a reasonably similar price range or without dramatic transaction costs. For example, you can go to sporting events, but not everybody can go to the Super Bowl. And if that goes to cable uh, and everyone has to pay for it, uh, there's no competition for that. Mr. Mooney? Uh, I think what cable offers is television. And how much other television do you look to be to, for in a market before you can say there's a constraint on cable prices 
and, and, and cable penetration. We don't think, incidentally, that's necessarily that, that there is a static answer to that. In 1985, our econometric uh, evidence told us that the right number was three broadcast stations. This morning, we will file at the FCC analysis which suggests that in 1990, it's five. But the, 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 the analysis we've done tells us that today, when you get to five, that's where you see a real dent being put into cable in a competitive sense. Mr. Barrow, you seem to be straining at the bit uh, there. Yes, Congressman, I, I would just like to say that uh, the language right now that's being introduced uh, by Congressman Cooper and also on the Senate side by Senator Danforth, I think that's a, a good starting point uh, to look at by uh, both uh, bodies of the legislature. Uh, obviously, in regards to also effective competition, I, I think we also have to realize that there's a couple other pieces of that mechanism. Uh, who's going to be the entity, obviously, to regulate cable, and what is the mechanism for rate regulation? Uh, I will tell you, as a, as a cable regulator, and also on behalf of the TOA, uh, we would obviously like to work with Congress uh, the best method possible to resolve, resolve that process. you think it's feasible to put this in a Public Utility Commission at the state level? I would like to uh, have the opportunity for cities, states, and also the federal government to uh, look at it. I think there's a possibility of a, a process for a body uh, that could possibly entail all three. Thank you. I yield back my time. Thank Gentleman's you. time has expired. And uh, all questioning on the first round uh, by subcommittee members has expired. Now, we've had a request by uh, a couple of members that uh, we continue to proceed, but the chair also takes note of the time um, that uh, has been consumed thus far in this hearing uh, and uh, the fact that uh, we're well into um, the, uh, the course of the, um, the congressional work day in terms of convenience to other members. Therefore, what I would like to suggest is that we would proceed <coughs> on a, uh, a follow-up question time in which members that seek recognition uh, would be recognized for two minutes on a tightly monitored uh, basis to ask any follow-up questions which they would like. And at the conclusion of that uh, uh, questioning period, uh, this hearing would be concluded. So if we hear no objection Chairman, to the, for the question and the answer, the question and the answer, which Serves as an effective discipline upon uh, both the question. I hope our witnesses are skilled in speed speaking. <laughs> um, the, uh, can, can you say that once more for the benefit of the answer givers? Uh, the answer is all questions and answers should be contained within that two minute two minute period, um, and so the precision of the questioning will be critical here in this. Uh, in this sounds uh, to me like a monopolistic subcommittee <laughs> decision. <laughs> The generosity of the uh, chairman and the allocation of time should not be questioned at this point <laughs> since uh, we are responding to the informal request of the gentleman who was just uh, recognized. So at this point in time, we will uh, recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania for two minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to just get back to the competition question. and I'd like to ask Mayor Ramirez, has he ever put out a bid for another franchise in the Laredo area? Uh, our franchise is not an exclusive franchise, and uh, there have been interested parties that have uh, approached the city, but nothing has been put down on paper. Have, have you sought to, to bring in another franchise? I mean, after all, the Cable Act does not prevent you from seeking another franchise, does it? No, absolutely not. Uh, have you, I, I, I would think with your calculations of rate increases, you would seek another franchise. Yeah, well, in essence, it's uh, like anything else, Congressman. If, if you want to go out and get the business, you can get it. But it's our, it, our responsibility as elected officials to protect the public interest at the time and not to go out and try to bring in competition. Okay, I would, sus I would purport that situations like yours should actively seek competition because you may like to regulate and you may see that as the appropriate response, but America works when there's competition. Absolutely. I would also urge you to consider, you know, al alternative tracks like the issue that is now coming up before the Congress uh, where, where TOCOs could 
could uh, carry signal. Um, Mr. Kimmelman, you have, uh, I, I would like just your, your response on the whole cable telco issue. Oh, yeah. You, you mentioned that you <laughs> wouldn't want another monopoly, Mr. Ramirez, you mentioned you wouldn't want another monopoly. Uh, but if you had two companies, that wouldn't be a monopoly anymore. No, I'm talking, you, we're talking about telcos. Yeah, yeah, but if you had a telco and a cable company, then, then the service would not be monopolized. Isn't not, that true? Not the cable service, but then our telephone and our cable service might be monopolized. Yeah, but, but, but I'm talking about just for delivery of cable services, they would not be a monopoly. Isn't that true? Oh, absolutely. There'd be two competitors out there. Okay. Uh, very Mr. Kimmelman, quickly, briefly. Congressman Gurr, um, telephone companies are far away from being able to offer competitive services. Everyone is proposing it says let's regulate now until that happens. We'd like to see promotion of competition. There are particular dangers related to telco entry, cross subsidization issues, and the expense of building a separate network. Uh, so we'd like to see the immediate problems dealt with first before Congress turns to that issue. But would you we promote? We promote as much competition. We'd much rather see competition than regulation. And as a matter of fact, we believe with the right test of, a comp of competition, if regulation is imposed now, it's a tremendous spur to the cable industry to allow more competition to get out from under that regulation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Schaefer. I uh, thank the generosity of the chair for one more, uh, one more question. Uh, it's my understanding, uh, the figures that I have, that in 1989 the cable industry paid about $768 million in franchise fees. And since 85, that total was, uh, ex exceeds, actually exceeds $3 billion. Now, since uh, the cable operators must pass reductions in franchise fees directly through to the consumers, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Barra and Mr. Ramirez, have you uh, ever considered this as a way to lower your subscriber rates? In dealing with franchise fees, Congressman, it's uh, like dealing with any, any other, uh, in this case, utilities that use a public right-of-way. Uh, the allocations that are made uh, uh, after the money is received from the different entities, whether it's uh, the light company, the telephone company, or in this case, the cable company that's also operating on, on public right-of-way, is subject to appropriations by a majority of the council, same way as anything that would get out of legislation out of this uh, subcommittee. So what you're saying to me is, no, you have never used any of the dollars that you received in franchise fees to reduce cable rates. No, but we have used them to promote public access and public programming that is in the best interest of our community. Uh, including the building of a police station? No, no police station has been built, Congressman, and I'd invite you to go down to Laredo and see for yourself. So you don't have a police station? We do, but it's an old one. <laughs> Mr. Barra. Uh, uh, Congressman, uh, we use our 5% franchise fee in the city of St. Louis exclusively so for franchise fee purposes in terms of regulation and also for local government access programming for our citizens. So you, you, do you charge the, the top amount that you can charge? Well, no, we, we charge 5%. Uh, sometimes there's uh, some problems with the computation done by the cable industry in regards to that area. But... Uh, you have uh, also, if you charge 5 percent, then the, the cost to the consumer is going to be more than if you charge well, 2 percent. I think, again, Congressman, the biggest thing in, in the city of St. Louis, though, is the fact that we have so many complaints from our subscribers that we need it for regulatory purposes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why you charge 5 percent. Yes, sir. And you, you cannot see any way that you could utilize any of those dollars to reduce uh, the uh, subscriber fees. No, not, not also because of the way our ordinance is set up for uh, local government access programming as well. The gentleman's time has expired. I thank the chairman. What I'd like to ask is each of the panelists now, in 30 seconds, in inverse order of their recognition for opening statements, to um, please summarize what the major point is that you want each of us on the subcommittee, the staffs, to retain as we're going through this uh, process uh, over the course of the next several months. Let us begin then, 30 seconds, let us begin now by recognizing once again Mr. Kimmelman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the main point we find here is that the market has changed since 1984 when Congress passed the Cable Act. There is a considerable monopolistic practice in the industry. Consumers are paying for it. Prices are too high. Service is inadequate. We believe you ought to reopen the Cable Act just to fine-tune it 
to bring those prices in line with market conditions and to open up the possibility of as much reasonable competition as possible. Okay. Mr. Hogan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in summary, I think that uh, that which I would like to leave you is uh, as a, as a programmer, as a responsible programmer, we are heavily dependent on subscriber fees. In order to improve our service, in order to continue to innovate and expand programming, <coughs> subscriber fees are vital to the continued success of Turner Broadcasting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Barra. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, cable television distribution wires are natural monopoly. Cable is the dominant gateway to the household television sets. The person who owns that wire is a monopolist and under current federal law is unregulated. We believe the best solution is to introduce competition, local government support, alternative delivery systems, competition renewals, overbills, and fair terms of access to cable by programming. Effective regulation is necessary until meaningful competition emerges in a majority of television homes. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, Mr. Robbins. Mr. Chairman, I would, I would say that you have a very successful service for the American people. I would hesitate tampering with it and its success. Leave the incentives in place for the industry to continue to invest in programming and to do the customer service job that it must and will do. Mr. Mooney. Well, the topic of this first of four hearings was rates and customer service. On rates, the government's own numbers say that cable rates have now leveled off, not, not just last month, but over the last year. And on customer service, we've come forward in response to not only business needs, but also the expressed concerns of this committee with customer service standards that I, that I frankly think nobody has laid a finger on in terms of the fact that they're real and, and that they're specific and that they're meaningful. And uh, our industry has been responsive. We understand this, these developments will not totally determine what this committee does in the future, but we think it should have, these developments should have a major impact. Thank you. And uh, Mayor Ramirez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First off, that the Cable Act of 1984 must be reformed and revised or rewritten, that Congress must now face a reality check on that theory which has proved to be flawed of effective competition, that cable once built is <coughs> a monopoly, and that the consumers know they are being victimized. Cable operators also have little incentive at this time to offer quality service that is fairly priced and consumer service practices are rapidly deteriorating. Congress must empower us to restrain uh, unfair pricing and cable monopolies and ensure good customer service. And the City of Laredo asks the Congress of the United States to reform the Cable Act now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Jim. you, Mayor Ramirez, very much. Let me uh, conclude by saying that um, it is the intention of the uh, subcommittee to legislate this year. Clearly, it is infinitely preferable to uh, introduce competition into the marketplace wherever necessary because, uh, with few exceptions, where there is real competition, there is very little need for additional uh, regulation uh, in any field of commercial endeavor. However, where real competition does not exist, uh, I believe that there is a real sense now that there may be some need in the terms, of, in the words of Mr. Kimmelman, to fine tune uh, the uh, Cable Act of 1984 uh, to ensure that there are proper protections which are built in for the consumer so that there is choice uh, for the consumer, uh, so that there is protection against unnecessary price increases. Uh, and to the extent to which uh, municipal officials, um, uh, state and local regulators, uh, consumer groups, and cable uh, industry representatives have had their voices heard here today. Uh, we intend on vigorously pursuing this subject in our uh, subsequent hearings. Uh, the issues are critically important. Uh, but uh, as is the tradition with this subcommittee, we will proceed deliberatively. Uh, we will proceed on a course uh, that uh, has the full intention of uh, neither uh, under-regulating nor over-regulating, while always looking for opportunities of injecting competition into the marketplace, uh, which would obviate the need for any additional regulation. 
Uh, that's the discussion which uh, we have uh, uh, opened here today. Uh, but I don't think there should be any question about it. Uh, the, uh, the full intention uh, this year is to uh, pass some legislation here, uh, but we're going to need the full participation of all of the, uh, of the witnesses here today and many others in order to ensure that that uh, uh, legislation neither stifles uh, further desirable cable growth, uh, but at the same time uh, doesn't uh, leave the consumer exposed to limited choice or to excess of pricing uh, with, and, uh, and, consume, and, uh, uh, and uh, local cable company practices uh, which leave the consumer with the, f with the feeling that they don't have a real recourse when problems develop with their own system. Uh, so that balance will be struck in the course of the, of the next several months. We want your full participation. Uh, we believe it can be a productive and uh, ultimately wholesome a result for both the industry and all of those who have concerns uh, for the industry uh, for the long-term future. So let's work together towards that goal and produce something that makes some sense. We thank you all for your participation. This hearing is adjourned. Note that the U.S. Senate will next meet at 2 p.m. Eastern Time Monday, and C-SPAN 2 will bring you live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the proceedings. After this short break, the focus will shift to events in the Middle East. from Washington, you're watching C-SPAN 2, and we'll take a short break now for some programming information. First, a reminder that we'll bring you a hearing held by the House